Today, I'm gonna to show you some practical strategies and examples of how I reduce my cognitive load and use encoding combined with active recall to learn brand new content. I'm gonna break down this complex topic of encoding into simple and easy to understand practical techniques which you can use right now to help you learn faster and more effectively regardless of what you're studying. I'm gonna dive into some of the evidence and research behind encoding and how we process new information into our long-term memory. Then I'm gonna to touch on how we can encode effectively and then I'll go into five practical encoding strategies which you can jump into and start using today. I'll also be doing lots of deep dives and screen sharing various examples from medicine to science to maths and other skills in future videos. So if you'd like to see those, do hit that subscribe button. But first, let's remind ourselves of what encoding actually is. So in terms of learning and memory formation, encoding is simply the act of moving information from the temporary store in your working memory into that permanent store in your long-term memory. Working memory is where you process anything that you're thinking about right now at this very moment. However, it has a limited capacity. Research shows that it can hold around seven or so items of information at any one time. So you can think of it a little bit like a juggler who can only juggle so many things at once. If you want to remember more than seven things, you're going to need to process that information in a way that makes sure it gets into that long-term memory so that you can retrieve it later. Psychologists say the more deeply we encode information, the better we're able to recall it. Now, what do we actually mean by deeply? Well, psychologists Craig and Lockhart in 1972 defined the levels of processing model as focusing on the depth of processing or encoding involved in memory. And it predicts the deeper information is encoded, the longer a memory will last. They split encoding up into three types, structural, phonetic, and semantic. These are simply terms with structural being what something looks like, phonetic being how it sounds, and semantic being what it means. Structural and phonetic are both shallow, while semantic is deep. And remember, the more deeply encoded the information, the better we recall it. So let's look at the probability of recall. The shallow level of processing information and encoding would give us a low probability of them being able to recall that same information. And a deep level of processing would give us a much higher probability of recalling and therefore having learned it. Let's say, for example, I want to remember the brachial plexus in surgical anatomy. At the structural level, I may at first pass just learn the word brachial plexus. At the phonetic level, you might relate this to words or phrases that sound like the term brachial plexus. And finally, at the semantic level, you're actually describing what the brachial plexus is. The basic idea here is that if you think about information more meaningfully, i.e. deep processing, you're much more likely to remember that information than if you think about it just at superficial, meaningless terms, which is shallow processing. And this is true regardless of whether you intend to learn the material or not. To illustrate this point in a little bit more detail, I want you to imagine you're in a classic psychology experiment by Thomas Hyde and James Jenkins from 1969 and see if you can guess the results. The basic design of their study is shown here and they used five different groups of participants. Each group was presented with a list of 24 words. The participants were given instructions about what they would do. Once all the words were presented, everyone had to try to recall them from their memory. Hyde and Jenkins looked at the impact of two variables on learning. The first was whether or not you knew you were going to have to recall the words after all of them were presented. If you were in one of the two groups in the intentional conditioning, you were forewarned that you would have to recall the words after they were all presented. If you were in one of the two groups in the incidental condition, you weren't forewarned about the recall test. It's like taking a surprise pop quiz and learning anything that occurred was incidental. The other variable Hyde and Jenkins looked at was how participants rehearsed or encoded words, what became known later as the levels of processing. Two groups had to listen to the words and check whether or not it had the letter E in the spelling. The other two groups had to then rate whether or not they found the actual word pleasant. Now, why would this make any difference at all? Well, if you're checking for E's or letters, then you're focusing on the spelling of the word, which is at the structural or shallow level of processing. If you're rating its actual pleasantness to you, you're thinking more deeply about the meaning of the words related to your own experience. This is called deep level processing. Now the list of 24 words was presented one word at a time and each group carried out its instruction. Afterwards, all the participants were asked to recall as many of the 24 words as they could. So who do you think recalled the most words? Well, let's look at the results and see what happened and see what it says about how we learn things. Now the average percentage recall is shown on the y-axis. Intent to learn had no effect at all. But the level of processing had a huge effect. The deep processing groups recalled a lot more than the shallow processing groups, regardless of whether or not they intended to learn. Now there are a few key points here. Firstly, people who use deep processing 
learn the material whether or not they intended to. On the other hand, the people who used a shallow strategy, even if they wanted to learn, they just couldn't. People who process words at a deep level, even if they weren't trying to learn, remembered them just as much as the control group who were doing their best to learn anything. So the depth of processing matters and intention to learn doesn't. You can have every intention to learn, but if you use a shallow strategy, you just won't be able to do it. Shallow levels involve studying meaningless superficial properties of what you're trying to learn, like mindless rereading or memorization of text. The deepest levels of processing involve thinking about material meaningfully, interpreting the information, and relating it to your prior knowledge or experience or creating a mental image of that information. Deeper processing leads to better recall. So if deep processing is the key to effective study, how do we accomplish this while we're studying? Well, the other helpful tool here is Bloom's Taxonomy, which I have a full video on which we'll put a link up to. To encode effectively, we want to move from the lower order methods of learning, like using memorization and just recalling facts from flashcards, and actually move up to higher order techniques that allow us to make learning more meaningful and connect things to what we already know, using the information to solve problems, organize that information, and essentially understand the topic well enough to put it into our own words, just like the Feynman technique. Remember, in this technique, it's where you can explain a complex topic in simple terms that a child could understand. Now, personally, when I'm learning, I have this nagging feeling inside of me to really understand what's going on. It's all about coherence within my mind. If there aren't any unexplained questions that I have left on a topic, then I'll consider it to be understood. I'll often ask myself, can I explain this concept in simple terms? And also, do I have any unanswered questions in my mind? So kind of an external ability to explain something to others, and then this internal coherence of do I understand the next step related to the topic? So for example, if I'm learning again, I'll break your plexus, I'm thinking, can I explain this to a child in simple terms? or can I draw this complex diagram if asked to do so in an exam? But also, do I know what the nerves of the brachial plexus supply? Do I know the clinical signs if they're damaged at different points? In educational psychology, understanding, deep encoding, and higher order learning techniques all boil down to three key principles, elaboration, distinctiveness, and personal experience. Now, elaboration simply means making meaningful associations between the concept you're studying and related concepts. The associations can be among concepts you're studying or with your prior knowledge. And the more meaningful associations you can make, the better you'll learn. Distinctiveness means that you can make clear contrasts between the concept you're learning and other things. You need to understand the key differences among related concepts. Say, for example, you're learning about the ventricles of the heart in anatomy. You elaborate the ventricles by relating them together as parts of the heart. They both pump blood. And you also emphasize the distinctiveness between the two by focusing on the key differences, like where they receive blood from and where they pump it to, and how one carries oxygenated blood and the other deoxygenated, which then relates to the thickness of their wall, and in turn, this leads to concepts like the valves and outside the anatomy, like physiology and human circulation. Finally, you can relate things to your own personal experience. Sticking with this example, maybe you saw a patient who needed a valve replacement, or maybe you saw a cartoon about how the heart pumped blood when you were a child. So these are the basic principles of deep processing. Successful encoding techniques usually involve tying in the new information into previously known information, and effective learning strategies take advantage of some or all of these principles. So let's look at some learning strategies that help us to encode information, starting off with one that probably isn't actually that great. So the first encoding technique I'm gonna to touch on involves mnemonic devices. And while these are memory aids that help you link what you're trying to learn into previously existing, easier to remember information, they're actually only really helpful if you're learning lists of information. And while it's important to touch on them, they are superficial learning tools rather than helping us to encode deeply. Mnemonic devices include images, acronyms, rhymes, and peg words, and the method of Loki, which is also known as a memory palace. Imagery is simply creating a vivid mental picture of whatever it is you're trying to remember. When I'm learning something, I actively seek out images and tables, and for subjects like medicine and biology, I'll make sure I start with concepts like anatomy first to help build a base for relating everything else to. Peg word systems and the method of Loki are used by memory masters, and both of these really just involve making anchors and linking your new information to those anchors. The anchors might be verbal cues, such as for peg words, rhyming ordered lists together, where the number one is gun, two is shoe, three is tree, and so on, and then you link the new content you're learning to those words and images. So if you're remembering a list, 
Maybe the gun is shooting the first item, the next item is in the shoe, the third is in a tree, and so on. The method of Loki is similar, but a little bit more visual and personal. Relating items to a room or location that you're familiar with, and then linking what you're learning to objects in that room. The same principles go for acronyms and rhymes. I use these frequently if I'm trying to recall facts like the causes of pancreatitis or the branches of the facial nerve. And I'll even make up my own acronyms and rhymes, the sillier the better. But the problem with all these methods is that although they're relating facts to existing information, we're probably not really understanding or moving to that higher order thinking. We're still at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy and in the superficial structural and phonetic levels of the processing model. And this is why most people who use flashcards to learn or use platforms like Quizlet or Anki probably aren't actually learning that effectively. A much better way to relate new information to existing is called chunking. And by chunking, we actually group the information that we're getting into meaningful units or chunks to help better organize that knowledge. So this ties it into meaningful categories that we already know. Now, if you're learning something from a course or textbook, some of this may have already been done for you by the teachers or authors. For example, if I'm learning biology or math, new concepts are introduced in chapters or sections from the source material. And that's why I'll usually skim through a chapter or look at learning outcomes to chunk things together and build context first to get a really good overview of what's coming up and help me to organize my knowledge and encode. And what's cool is you can chunk pretty much anything in a way that makes sense to you. For example, I might group things I'm learning by areas of the body, or if I'm trying to remember what to pick up from the shops, I might group things by meal or type of product I'm shopping for. As long as the categories make sense to you and those chunks will be retrievable, then that's great. In terms of how to actually chunk concepts effectively, I'll usually start by looking at the big picture first and look at what I'm trying to learn and then focus on getting a basic understanding of what that is and where my new content fits into my existing knowledge. This is where the skim reading technique comes in or looking at learning outcomes or key summaries within textbooks or videos. There's both a top-down chunking process that occurs where you focus on the big picture and where your learning fits in. And then there's also a bottom-up chunking process where practice and active recall help you to build on each chunk and make things relevant as you encounter questions and problems that naturally link concepts together. For example, if I'm learning about gastrointestinal pathology, I'll group diseases by which organs and structures they affect as a top-down approach, but will also then go bottom up when linking things like gastric ulcers to the physiology of gastric acid secretion and how the disease is actually caused. So as well as understanding the symptoms and when something happens, I'm also learning from the bottom up about how something happens and the context behind it. Next up is question generation. After I've read a chapter or reviewed a section of notes or part of a video, I'll typically generate some questions about the material and I'll try to make the questions as meaningful as possible and as higher order as possible. But what does this actually look like? Well, questions about facts are okay, but questions that make you compare and contrast, analyze, make connections, or generate examples are way better. If you can make the questions personal, that's absolutely perfect. Just generating the questions will help you to get a much deeper depth of processing. Reviewing the material to answer them is even better. At first, generating questions will feel a little bit awkward, but like anything with practice, it will become much easier and more natural. For me, I'll come to the end of a paragraph, a diagram, a table, or a chapter, and I'll simply write down something like, explain the concept or whatever it is I'm learning. Or in the case of medicine, draw the brachial plexus. Or even better, what does a lesion of the C5 nerve root cause? These questions help me to test my understanding and also form part of how I take notes as I learn new information. And sticking to what I mentioned earlier, I'll then try and explain things to a child using the Feynman technique. For the latter, I'll start to pull on the string of anything I'm not sure about and add these as questions. Once I've chunked and ordered what I've learned and I've generated questions, I'll then focus down on application of knowledge using active recall. There are a few things I'll do here. The first is I'll seek out worked examples within the source materials that I'm learning from. This might be questions at the end of a chapter, or it might be some call out boxes walking through a math equation. These help to bring structure and context to how problems are solved and how concepts are then applied, and gives me a framework and scaffolding to reduce my cognitive load. The reason I use the word appropriate is that it's important that the recall questions that you're using are the correct difficulty level and in the correct format for your exam or test. For this reason, I'll jump into past papers and question banks early, or if I'm learning a language or musical instrument, I'll start practicing straight away. As I go through the first pass, I'm not so worried about whether I'm getting these correct or incorrect. I'm much more interested in highlighting in my mind what areas I have absolutely no clue about and which I find the most challenging. I can then go back through and make a conscious effort to focus on these areas. 
After you've practiced recalling the test or recalling the information, you can check yourself against your textbook and your notes. This will help you identify weaknesses in your understanding of the material and it allows you to further connect concepts. And I'll try and use video or audio here to help reduce my cognitive load rather than just going back to the same materials and going through my old notes. Now, teaching others involves a great deal of deep processing and it makes it more likely that you'll be able to retain that information. Even preparing to teach has been shown to make you self-reference concepts more deeply, meaning that you imagine that you're learning this material in order to teach it to somebody else. When that happens, you're actually able to remember it a lot better because you're putting a lot more effort into organizing and understanding the information that you're taking in. When I learn, especially for spoken exams like surgical OSCEs and Viber style tests, I'll often study in a group. This first provides accountability, but it also helps to ease my cognitive load as we'll all be contributing to help each other understand topics in simple terms. The way that I like to use group teaching is that each person in the group picks a topic to teach others and then they explain it in as simple terms as possible and the other group members then ask questions if they're not quite sure about something. This helps the person teaching to appreciate if the way they've explained it is simple enough and also allows for friendly natural quizzing and active recall session. The discussion will naturally progress to learning around the topic to build understanding and the process of creating the teaching materials is the top of Bloom's taxonomy as the highest order when you're creating new things from existing knowledge. Now, the final technique I want to tell you about is a little bit different than the other ones that we've touched on, and it's all about taking breaks. Remember, encoding and cognitive load are about your working memory, which can only hold seven or so items at a time. So trying to cram too much information in or working when sleep deprived is gonna be counterintuitive. Spacing means you should spread out your study sessions over time rather than cramming them all into one massive study session. And it also has that benefit of spreading out our active recall and reducing the forgetting curve. This is kind of unintuitive because a lot of people think that if you have five hours to study, then you should do it all at once right before the test. So it's fresh in your mind. But what researchers have found is that if you actually space out your study sessions, so if you have five one hour study sessions across five days, you'll actually remember that information a heck of a lot better. Because if you're studying something for an hour and then you start your second hour, all that information really seems fluent. And you're like, yeah, I kind of got this. But if you study for an hour, wait a day, and then you start your second hour, it feels a lot harder and you realize that you don't know it quite as well as you thought you might. So one reason spacing is thought to be helpful is because it lets you know what you don't know while you're studying. And it also introduces a form of self-testing so you're able to prepare yourself better for any test or exam. Similarly, diffuse thinking is about creative problem solving. If you find yourself getting stuck or unable to comprehend something, it's likely that you're cognitively overloaded. Diffuse thinking is what happens when you relax your mind and provide space for daydreaming and wandering thoughts. That's something that many people miss or undervalue. It's the fact that even when your conscious mind stops concentrating on something, your brain continues to process it. And this fits nicely in with spacing, as this triggers diffuse thinking and doing things like mindfulness or getting enough sleep really relaxes you and helps to trigger your brain even if you're not actively focusing on something. Now, effective encoding techniques do involve a little extra effort, but hopefully now in your learning, you can be prepared to process information in a productive way so that you can study efficiently and effectively. I hope you enjoyed this video. We touched on encoding and also memory, and I've got some great videos that dive deeper into those topics to help you build up those levels of understanding and go deeper into the points which we've covered. As I mentioned, there are some great practical guides on the way, and I'll also be diving into how to be more productive and beat procrastination when learning to keep your attention focused to reduce that cognitive load even further. So do hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see those videos when they drop. And let me know about any other topics you'd like to see covered in the comments below. Thanks again for watching. Thanks so much for subscribing and I'll catch you again in the next video.